Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to Zoom Into Nature. Tonight, we are joined by Uli Lormer as he introduces us to his recent book, The Northeast Native Plant Primer, 235 Plants for an Earth-Friendly Garden. I have collaborated with my colleagues, Ann Cicerella of the Cleveland Pollinator and Native Plant Symposium, and Judy Semrock from Nature Spark to bring you this event. Last winter, we joined forces to bring you inviting biodiversity into our gardens, which featured five sessions on landscaping to promote diversity in our backyards. With close to 500 viewers at each session, it demonstrated the genuine interest in this topic. And we are pleased to provide you with additional tools and resources to landscape with a purpose. And I'd like to give a special thanks to Anne Cicerella for personally sponsoring this evening's event. Thank you, uh, Anne, for being such a strong proponent of native plantings that support our pollinators. I am Renee Baranca, the Manager of Conservation Education and Outreach at Western Reserve Land Conservancy. At the Land Conservancy, I develop nature-based programming, both virtually and in person, for people of all ages, often utilizing the expansive network of conservation properties the Land Conservancy has protected in Northeast Ohio, which totals close to 70,000 acres of natural landscapes, family farms, and urban green spaces. You can learn more about my programs on the Land Conservancy's website, and I'll place a link in the chat. Tonight, we are focusing on the impact our backyard habitats have on biodiversity. Even small spaces can have a big effect on supporting our native pollinator species and other wildlife. Envision all these gardens connected, forming a network of habitats. During tonight's presentation, please place your questions in the Q&A section at the bottom of the screen. We'll have plenty of time to answer them after the presentation. And lastly, we have partnered with Loganberry Books to offer Louis's book with a special signed book plate. For those who still need to purchase the book, I'll place a link so you can order yours today. And it's my pleasure to introduce Uli Lormer. Uli is the Director of Horticulture at the Native Plant Trust in Framingham, Massachusetts. He oversees daily operations at both Garden in the Woods and Nasami Farm, which is a nursery focused on propagation of and research about New England native plants. He is a tireless advocate for the use of native plants in the designed landscape. Welcome, Uli. Thank you. Uh, and a special thank you to uh, Renee and to Anne for inviting me back to speak um, and thank to um, give me the ch a chance to share with you all about my book. Um, so I'm also very pleased and uh, I'm happy to be here. Great. I'm just going to um, share my screen real quick. Mm -hmm. Okay. So. Uh, and a big thanks to all of you for tuning in today. I hear, uh, at least with some folks, that it's raining, which is always a good thing. Um, we've had a, a particular dry spell here uh, over in Massachusetts, and um, <clears throat> a, a really unusually bad pine pollen season. Um, so if, I, if I'm sounding raspy and so forth, it's uh, because I've been breathing pine pollen for the last two weeks. Um, so... Um, the uh, the the book I think is uh, is a is really a culmination of about twenty years or plus uh, more of, of growing native plants and working with native plants, uh, along with uh, photographing native plants. I also took all of the images in the book, um, and it was a really wonderful opportunity to sort of pour as much of my experience as possible into into a resource, um, and hopefully encourage and inspire others to um, to. Um, embrace and, and welcome more native plants into their gardens. Uh, I wanted to start with a little bit about me um, and how I got interested in gardening. Um, and uh, I, I owe my green thumb uh, uh, almost entirely to my mother's side of the family, to my maternal grandmother here, uh, Renate, uh, to my own mother, um, Freya, who's sitting on the right, and um, to my wife, who I also met at uh, Brooklyn Botanic Garden um, 14 years ago. Um, and I have very, very fond memories as a child. Um, we, I grew up uh, partly in Germany before moving to the United States when I was about five um, and spending a lot of time in my grandmother's gardens. And, uh, and she and I would go on nightly slug hunts um, with a trowel and a bucket. Um, and uh, we would really, uh, um, you know, spend a lot of quality time together. Um, we moved to Wilmington, Delaware when I was a child, uh, and uh, I grew up very close to Longwood Gardens, and, and I didn't really know at the time that it would figure in so prominently in, my, in terms of my influences, 
Um, we also spent a, a year in Tucson, Arizona, um, which was a really wonderful exposure to desert habitats and so forth. Um, but um, Longwood would, was always a wonderful place to run around. Of course, as a kid, you know, I was mostly interested in the koi pond and not so much in the plants. Um, but I'd like to think that it had a, a real influence in, in my career choice moving forward. And as a kid, I was always really interested as uh, uh, um, and wanting to know what the different plants were when we went on hikes in the state parks and so forth. And I oftentimes would turn over logs and, you know, look for insects and those sorts of things. And that uh, carried on uh, as, a, as an attraction, so to say, uh, into my adulthood. Um, and where I was frequently spotted at my former employer, uh, Brooklyn Botanic Garden, with some manner of insect or salamander or sedge bouquet uh, in my hands. Um, and so I think I've never really lost that, um, I'd say, sort of boyish enthusiasm for the natural world. Um, and, and I feel very fortunate um, to have found something that I'm very passionate about and been able to make a career and a living out of it. So this book uh, was, was really aimed at uh, non-professionals. Um, and I really wanted to make sure that the tone of the language wasn't overly technical. Um, but that it was uh, inherently sort of inspirational and hopeful. Um, I think that, you know, depending on where you get your news, we have uh, a lot of different uh, um, ways of measuring uh, why things aren't, aren't, aren't looking so good in the environment at the moment. And I really do believe that native plants have a particular power to heal our landscapes and to help us sort of bridge the gap between the natural world and our, our, uh, and our gardens themselves. Um, some of the challenges that I think that, that uh, I am, uh, attempt to address in the book are to really emphasize why ecological horticulture is important. Uh, and this is really the, sort of the idea that gardens can no longer just be pretty. You know, we've spent many, many decades in pursuit of pretty gardens. Um, and I think that it's time for us to have pretty and ecological function. And part of that is also to push, it, to push back a little bit against our sort of collective uh, obsession with neat and tidy. Uh, and what I mean here are the, you know, the straight lines and edges, the uh, uh, ubiquitous mulch that's everywhere, um, the clipped hedges, uh, all of the things that, that, you know, if you look at it from the amount of work and resources that are necessary, to maintain that as an aesthetic, uh, it's rather intensive. Um, you know, there's been, uh, I think, a lot of talk recently about um, reducing lawns, and I, I'm, I'm in favor of this. I'm not a purist that says you should get rid of all of your lawns. Um, I am the father of two small boys and, and completely understand the utility of a lawn space. Um, but my lawn has clover and violets and Houstonia and other things in it, and I try to mow it you know, not super, super low. And um, I think there are lots of small steps that people can do uh, to embrace more diversity in lawns um, and to kind of get away from, you know, what I would call the Augusta mindset. Um, and also to recognize that, that change comes slowly. Um, you know, particularly if you work with plants on a daily basis, you understand that you are bound by their time frames and temporal scales and that success is measured in seasons and years and not necessarily uh, in, in you know, um, email sent uh, or, or inboxes cleared. Um, I think that the time is now. Uh, I think that there's been an absolute explosion of interest in native plants over the past couple of years. Uh, I would hesitate to say one of the positive things to come out of, uh, of the global pandemic has been a, a a refocus and a resurgence and in interest in gardening in general, and particularly in native plant gardening. And I'll explore that topic a little bit. Um, I think there's a lot of different factors that are driving the surge in interest. Um, you know, again, all the different ways in which you can measure uh, um, the loss of, of, uh, of uh, and extinctions of wildlife, um, the sort of perceived decrease in wild areas, um, you know, if you're somebody who's grown up in the same town, um, you've probably noticed that new developments are there or things that used to be a woodlot aren't anymore. Uh, and all those little small incremental changes kind of add up to this sense that we're losing those natural spaces. 
I think there's a genuine desire for people to make a positive change and they want to do something to support wildlife in the face of all of this bad news. And I think there's a great deal of anxiety over what the future holds. Um, over, you know, we don't know what the, the effects of climate change will be. Um, we know that it's unpredictable, that there'll be more frequent storms and more intense storms. Uh, and so I think people are really trying to think of ways in which they can contribute to, uh, um, you know, adding resiliency uh, to a landscape that will hopefully buffer the effects of, of sort of this uncertain future. Um, I also think the loss of biodiversity is a very real thing, uh, and that can be measured in any, in any number of different ways uh, with, with losses of insects or losses in, in, um, in bird life. Um, but before I move on, I wanted to sort of take a quick side tangent to introduce another idea that I think is really thought provoking and interesting. Um, and it's relatively new in the world of conservation, uh, and it involves the idea of bioproportionality as opposed to biodiversity. And biodiversity is, is measured as a, uh, the, the quantity of different things. And so, you know, if we look out at this scene here, this is a, a, a beautiful uh, a grassland on a sand plain in Maine. Um, and I could go through here with my botanist eyes and come up with a pretty comprehensive list of the different kinds of plants that are in here. And then you add to that the insect life and the bird life and so forth, and you get a sense of how biodiverse this particular patch is. Um, what you're also seeing, the purple flower, uh, is actually a very rare plant. Uh, it's our New England blazing star, a Liatra species. And this particular location happens to be a stronghold for this species with you know, 15 to 20,000 individuals. But elsewhere in uh, New England, um, this is a very rare plant with very small populations. And the idea of bioproportionality uh, sort of challenges us to say, well, it's, it's good enough to have one of everything or a minimum amount of everything, but what we really need and how big of a population would you need in order for each and every one of those individual and unique individual kinds of things to be able to sustain itself and adapt and grow in the face of an uncertain future. And so, uh, again, I think this is a really strong argument for the use of species of native plants and even common plants, um, because the more numbers of the same things that we plant out and common things that we plant out, um, the greater proportion, the greater, the larger the size of that population is and the, and the greater chance that it can adapt and change with time. Um, I think that the idea of biodiversity has really been skewed towards maintaining a minimum amount of population size. And it's oftentimes used as a justification for development, for destruction, and for disturbance that, well, as long as this thought over here remains biodiverse, then that's okay, even if you know, a quarter of the number of things uh, only count uh, in perhaps the dozens of individuals. Uh, it still counts at equally and is weighted equally as, you know, a little blue stem where there may be 100,000 individuals. So I think it's a, an interesting shift in how we think about loss of biodiversity and how we think gardening can assist with, with uh, uh, um, making sure that there's enough of each of those things on the landscape for them to persist and, uh, and, and survive and thrive. So um, the popularity of native plants uh, extends and can be measured in a number of different ways. Um, um, I think in, in the public sphere, um, there are increasingly, at least here in New England, um, a lot of different ways in which people are asking for or demanding native plant materials. Um, we had a, uh, a request for a proposal through Maine DOT to do a pilot project where they wanted to seed uh, uh, highway uh, right of ways and median strips with pollinator plants uh, and to kind of explore the availability of seed and feasibility of this with the idea of expanding it out on a statewide scale. So we're talking about uh, a need for literally thousands of pounds of native plant seeds. Similarly, there are sort of citizen-led smaller grassroots efforts at the municipal level uh, to create pollinator pathways and connectivity between natural spaces and in and through 
uh, townships and, and smaller uh, uh, villages um, so that pollinators have a, a sort of a green corridor uh, to be able to move around uh, with enough floral resources. One of my staff members was involved in a, a successful um, uh, passing of a, an ordinance in the town of Somerville or city of Somerville outside of Boston, which now has legislated the use of native plants for, uh, uh, um, for any new public plantings and park plantings. Um, and just looking over the list here, there are schools and universities. We're partnering with Smith College right now in Northampton um, to do bulk seed increases, and they're going to be putting these plots on campus and engaging the student body in a new and intentional way uh, to get them interested in plant conservation and, and sort of real hands-on actionable things that they can do to help the planet. Uh, every botanic garden that I'm aware of uh, currently has some sort of native plant display or uses native plants, and that's a nod again to their popularity. Um, I have a, a, a few shopping centers near me that have used uh, native uh, uh, um, cultivars, but native plants nonetheless as part of a selling port, a point for that. Um, increasingly seeing them used uh, in green roofs and green infrastructure and bioswales and so forth. So there's a lot of interest in, in the public sphere uh, uh, for using native plants. In private spaces, we're seeing increasingly more people who are looking to forsake their lawns uh, or non-native exotic plantings. Uh, a really wonderful article here from the Washington Post back in April that kind of chronicled the trials and tribulations of a, of a, a couple um, who lived in Virginia, um, or maybe it was in Maryland, and uh, their struggles with their homeowners association and, uh, and wanting to have a meadow out front and, and a wild and diverse garden and uh, then being served papers by their homeowners association asserting that if they didn't fall in line with the rest of the neighborhood that they would face legal action and monetary fines. Um, so these are all, I think, really, uh, 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 again, different metrics by which you can see that this message is really getting into the mainstream and popular media. We have a whole new generation of designers and landscape gardeners who are emphasizing ecology and native plants. And I can say that educational interest, and I, I can't speak for Renee, uh, uh, but I know that our uh, um, registration for all of our programming at Native Plant Trust um, has been up nearly 40% over the last year, and, and it was up 40% the last year before that. So it's just been unprecedented amount of interest. Um, native plants are beginning to grace the covers of popular magazines like Fine Gardening and Horticulture magazines. I even found this article on Forbes magazine online uh, about you know, the hottest trend that's here and the shift to native plants and what it means for your business. And um, this particular woman, who's a CEO of a nursery in Tennessee, um, really explained the, the positive uh, feedback that she got from, you know, transitioning from traditional uh, nursery offerings to only native plants and how she's been getting into restoration ecology and uh, um, supplying the state with uh, 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 plants. And it's just been a really wonderful experience for her. So again, native plant sales, uh, really all through the roof and we currently have a, a sort of supply chain issue at least here in the northeast um, where the the demand is far outpacing the uh, the availability of plants and it's all across it from whether it's smaller nurseries whether there are uh, uh, niche nurseries that only sell native plants uh, all the way up to to box stores like lowe's and home depots and the, and the, the larger garden centers um, everyone's picking up on this trend and, and giving the people what they want. Um, our plant sales at Native Plants Trust, 30% in increase in sales last year alone. I think this year we will finally crack the million dollar mark for sales, which for a, a small organization like us is pretty unprecedented and uh, very, very good news. So I thought about, uh, you know, in, in writing this book, because the bulk of it was written during the darkest days of the pandemic and how I could help uh, inspire people to welcome more native plants. And so um, I did so with a couple of different things in mind. First and foremost was to kind of introduce the idea of ecoregions. 
um, and to try to encourage people to, to delve a little bit deeper into this concept. And what it is, is um, it's a, a, a concept that was put forth by the EPA. Uh, if anybody has uh, wants to look at the EPA's version of this map, all you need to do is Google EPA eco regions map and look at the level three map. Um, they have four different levels. Um, the most granular and finer detail is level four. This is a, a, a kind of an adaptation of the level three. But what it shows you is that there are um, underlying ge you know, geologic, soil, hydrology, plant community similarities that unite regions across, this, across the landscape. So the Northeastern Highlands zone that you see here um, has a little finger that gets all the way into the Poconos in Northern New Jersey and then it encompasses the Catskills, the Berkshire Mountains in Western Massachusetts, almost the entire states of, of Vermont and New Hampshire, the Adirondacks, all the way up into the Western parts of Maine and Canada. And there's uh, some similarities to the plants that are found there. And so it's the, basically the idea is that, that you, know, you want to be, you want to only plant things that are native to Massachusetts. Well, that's great. The plants don't really care if you live in Massachusetts or Ohio or anywhere else. And they distribute themselves along these lines much more. And so ideally, you would want to source your plants from within your ecoregion if possible. But I'm happy enough that people even are exposed to the idea and think about it a little bit differently. One of the other topics that uh, I, I broached very briefly in this, uh, um, in this book was to also bring in a little bit of ecology and the idea of plant succession. And so Plant succession is this process by which uh, um, landscapes are reclaimed after some kind of disturbance, whether it's a natural disturbance like a fire or a man-made disturbance like agriculture. Um, and so, you know, you farm a field for a while and then you let it be, um, there was gonna be uh, um, shade intolerant uh, and very prodigiously, uh, uh, um, you know, seed producing, uh, uh, ruderal species that move in first, and then they slowly provide and, and create the conditions for more shade tolerant things to come along. So things like the red cedar or gray birch um, are these early, early, you know, pioneer species, if you like. And if a little bit of knowledge about that will help you make good selections. Um, you know, we've got a dozen or more goldenrod species, for example, and not all of them are well suited for small spaces. Some are, others are much more at home at a 10 acre uh, a field where they can ramble and, and, and you know, uh, move around with their rhizomes. Um, but you need to know that information ahead of time. And so again, it's not that they're invasive natives or aggressive, uh, they've just evolved to, to occupy a certain ecological niche and if you have that information in mind, then you can make better choices whether you have a large space to garden or a small space to garden. I think welcoming in life into your garden does not have to be particularly difficult. It can it involves having three dimensional structure. So trees, shrub layers, ground cover layers, um, letting the leaves stay for the most part. Um, you know, leaves are free mulch. Um, why, why rake them out of your beds or blow them out of your beds and then put other mulch that you have to buy back in there when nature does it for you for free. And this little Carex lawn that you see over here, uh, uh, not only has have lots of good leaf litter, but you can see there's a lot of spiders in there. It's just completely brimming with life. A lot of our queen bumblebees and other sorts of insects uh, overwinter in the leaf litter. Um, so it's not really something that you have to get away and, and, and tidy up. Uh, and get ahead of spring cleanup. Um, I think that um, this sort of approach, again, is a little bit of a push against the neat and tidy idea. You can most certainly rake and, and clear off sections of your lawn if you're something that you use more frequently, but think about leaving, where, leaving those leaves uh, right where they lay um, in, in perennial beds and other sorts of areas. Um, again, with insects, and with ecological value, uh, again, we, we've got to not just think of plants and, uh, as, as being for us and for being pretty. Um, there are no other groups of plants that come to supporting as much insect life as native species do. 
It's not to say that non-natives are devoid of insect life. That's not true. They do support some things. But many of our insects, many of our uh, uh, um, specialist pollinators have akin to what I'd like to call dietary restrictions. They can only eat or survive on a particular plant's pollen or leaves. And if those plants aren't on the landscape, then those insects are on the landscape. And again, you're losing functional diversity along with species richness um, by not having these plants on here. One of my favorites here is our, our Clematis uh, virginiana, the virgin's bower. And I thought I'd put together sort of a rogues gallery of, of non-traditional pollinators. So things like cicada killers and uh, you know big ugly flies and daddy long legs all doing their part so that this plant can make copious amounts of seed. And in the bottom right corner, you see the seed heads that produce this really wonderful fluff. And I learned later on that goldfinches love to use this to line their nests in the springtime. And I couldn't think of a more delightful kind of circle of life with this wonderful plant that's got a great fragrance that supports a, a real cast of characters. And then even, uh, even in its senescence um, is providing comfort and safety for a new generation of songbirds. Really wonderful. Lawn care, as I said, is a huge business in this country, $105 billion a year. Um, I've heard that more gasoline is spilled filling uh, lawn mowers than was spilled in the Exxon Valdez. Uh, and that the amount of lawn space in this country as a mostly a monoculture of non-native grasses is equal to the size of, of Pennsylvania, the entire state of Pennsylvania. Um, they're ecological deserts, a lot of water, a lot of pesticides, a lot of fertilizer, it all goes to, uh, to try to make them uh, um, you know, be what, they, what, what we want them to be. Uh, and it doesn't have to be that way. And there's lots of ways in which you can welcome diversity into your lawn uh, without getting rid of it completely. Um, this scene is a scene from the New Jersey Pine Barrens, and it's the site of a former mill town that was abandoned in the 1880s. And what has come in since is an entire lawn of Oak's Edge. Nobody ever mows it. Um, and it just looks like this. And you go through the woods and it's lots of low bush blueberry and you come to the site of uh, where this mill town used to be. Um, and it's like you're in a park. It's fantastic. I also make the distinction in this book in that I recommend only species instead of cultivars of natives. And I recognize that um, um, finding species of natives in the nursery trade is difficult, um, but I'm hoping that people will be inspired to, to try to, to seek those out. Um, the real gold standard for us are going to be seed grown plants because they're genetically diverse. They're uh, a local ecotype. Uh, it feeds into what pollinators prefer. And the again, idea that plants that support insects are eventually also going to support a lot of bird life as well. Um, and so again, it's just not to say that planting cultivars is wrong or bad. Uh, I just think that we can uh, try to aim for uh, um, the plants that give us the most in terms of ecological value and aesthetics, and oftentimes that is species over natives. I also included a number of lists that I've, I've titled as plant solutions. I love lists. Um, I, I had a, a, an, um, at the university in undergrad, I had a professor who our, all of our tests were making lists. Make me a list of you know, five purple flowered perennials that like sun and wet soils or make me a list of this. And I think they're really handy to be able to look at for things like drought tolerance or salt tolerance or evergreen or uh, spreading and suckering shrubs. And then more importantly, a theme that is really weaving, woven uh, throughout the entire book is the amount of, of uh, insect life that these plants support. And so there's a not comprehensive, but not a, a small list of host plants for caterpillars and moths. Um, I've also included in the plant, plant profiles these uh, little icons that indicate whether or not birds make use of the plant, either by eating the food or dispersing the seed or using it as nesting or shelter, whether it supports native pollinators, whether it supports butterflies as a food source, whether it's a larval host, and then not to forget about our mammal and reptile and amphibian friends. They also make use of some of these plants. So the little frog icon is there to say, hey, uh, we like these plants too. So a sample page here from the shrubs. Uh, and I picked both of these erroneous because they're really fantastic plants. They have all the icons. 
uh, and they're multi-season in terms of aesthetical interest with great fall color, uh, berries and fruit that support birds, uh, um, wonderful white uh, uh, flowers in the springtime, um, and just a, a great shrubs all around. Uh, in the vine section here again, uh, uh, trying to introduce uh, the fact that we have lots of vines, they can be used in lots of different ways, uh, and that oftentimes, particularly in thick, uh, um, thickly grown vines, that, that's a favorite place for birds to nest. They feel very uh, um, protected and hidden inside of the tangle. Um, wildflower section is by far the largest because uh, it's a diverse group of plants. They grow in all different kinds of light conditions and soil types. Um, and I think that there, there's beauty in all seasons. I also encourage people here to go out and try to see these plants in the wild um, because I think it's really useful for gardeners to be able to see what kind of plant communities these plants grow in or how they distribute themselves. Um, and, uh, and I think it's a really uh, a good practice to get into. Lastly, I also included a section of annuals um, and that uh, many people don't realize that we have a number of true annuals. And I'm not talking about the petunias or the begonias that we use as bedding plants, which are actually really perennials in tropical climates. Um, they just don't like our cold winter, so they turn to mush. These are really true annuals that um, will germinate quickly, they'll grow quickly, they'll flower very profusely in the one season because that's all they have. And they make seed. And what I love about them is they move around. They are, they're here one minute, they're there the next, they move around. They're not intended to be long-term members of, of any kind of planting, but they hold space and they provide resources for, uh, for wildlife. So <clears throat> I managed to get one picture of my older son in the book. Um, kind of out of a out of a, uh, um, a hope that that people understand as as as, as um, many people do that gardening is really kind of a belief in the future. You know, like planting a tree now doesn't mean that you expect to to see this tree grow into its full glory and maturity, but that you hope that subsequent generations might do that. And being a parent is a, is certainly a big motivation to. Uh, try to, to, you know, spread the good word here um, because I want him to, to enjoy um, the fruits of all of this as much as anyone else. And with that, I think I'll, I'll leave you with one of my more favorite passages here, which is to say that, you know, using native plants is not an attempt to recreate conditions from the past. It's actually a very forwarding, think, forwarding uh, uh, thinking act, and it's an act of compassion uh, uh, in the face of a very changing world for whatever remaining flora and fauna are still here. And I oftentimes get uh, accused or confronted and saying, well, using only natives or using only species is sort of limiting or elitist. Uh, and I think that it doesn't hold up unless you're entirely gardening for yourself. And that um, sort of facing the, the, the uh, and realizing the destruction that we as humans have put onto the planet does take a degree of courage and it really makes you question about what are the things that are most important and what you value. And if you use, if you look at those things through the lens of, 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 uh, of value, you can see that native species are actually a, 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 an act of liberation instead of a shackle. Um, and then again, it shows that you place um, the ability for future generations to take advantage of the same benefits and privileges of biodiversity that we and our ancestors have enjoyed. So. With that, I would like to say thank you very much for listening, and I'm very happy to entertain any questions. Great. Stop sharing my screen here, so. Thanks, Uli. Thanks for the presentation and the intro to your book. So will you, as you can imagine, we have questions. I'm gonna go in the order that they came in. So sure. Megan is asking if you can speak to neonics and their use in big box stores and how they can affect pollinators. Sure. So, so neonicotinoids are uh, um, more often used in agricultural settings. Uh, they're often used as seed treatments, so that the seeds are soaked in the stuff. So, because it's a systemic product that, uh, as the plant grows, whatever might feed on it uh, will will die essentially. Uh, and I think it's one of the, the more insidious things is that it's not like it's a residue or something that you can see on the plant. And I think it is one of the cruelest ironies in that 
you seek out native plants with the hope of supporting uh, uh, pollinators, but are unwittingly poisoning the very things that uh, you're trying to support. So um, again, asking your nursery, are these grown with pesticides of any kind? And what guarantees can you give me that they are not? And the nurseries that know this and that are actually doing it will make that a point, a selling point and a point of pride. And if they're saying, I don't really know, or I have to check, or let me go talk to my boss about it, chances are they're probably uh, uh, using pesticides in some way, shape, or form. Mm -hmm. And I wouldn't discount, even as disappointing as it is to come away empty-handed from the nursery when confronted with so many beautiful things, um, your dollar is carries a lot of leverage and weight. And to say, I'd be happy to shop here, but until you can give me some guarantees that these plants are not grown with pesticides, I'm going to take my business elsewhere. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and don't be afraid to say that. You know, the nursery industry will listen. Right. It's all about demand. They're going to provide you with what you want to plant in your garden, hopefully. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. So Carolyn asks, and, and please forgive me because I don't know all of these um, plant names. So she purchased a Massachusetts, is it? Knick Knick or is it a yeah, Knick Knick? It's a it's okay. A, um, it's a Native American name for this particular plant. Okay, she knows it's native, um, but not sure if it's going to thrive in Northern Ohio's Zone Six. What are your thoughts? Um, it will most certainly thrive as long as you can give it um, full sun and not a lot of competition. This is a plant that likes to grow in sandy and gravelly situations. Um, it doesn't like shade and it doesn't like being in amongst lots of other taller plants. So it's a, it's a shrub. It's also known as bearberry, if you guys know that. So it's an evergreen shrub with really beautiful little, you know, Heath family flowers, uh, can form a really wonderful mat over time, but you have to give it good drainage and full sun and, uh, um, not, uh, uh not a lot of competition. Um, but it's absolutely hardy in Ohio. No problems. Okay. Excellent. Um, so you you were talking about the ecoregions, Uli, and yes. someone asked if you could elaborate a little bit on the Erie Drift a bit more. So I think the Erie Drift is is a uh, it's a it's an ecoregion that was influenced by the last ice age, um, and about how the uh, um, that particular region. Um, was really scoured by the receding uh, uh, glacier um, that ended up um, becoming Lake Erie. Okay. Um, and so as it's sort of, a, again, it's hard to consider that they're saying like, well, the lake was bigger at one point and then got smaller as, okay. as more water drained away uh, and melted. Um, sure. And so that is what I think the Erie Drift is. But again, if you if you go to the EPA website, um, all of those ecoregions have a, a, a number code, and then there's an explanation of what exactly that, like how did they come up with that particular designation and definition, and, um, and there's a lot more information to explore there. So I would definitely recommend following up yeah. um, by looking at the EPA. And I, when I do a follow-up with from this event, I'll send a link to that website too, so folks can readily access it. Um, okay, so Wendy asks, how can we break through our present governing administrations, both local and national, to add or change policies that would support native gardens in schools and communities? That's a really tough challenge. Yeah. Um, I think that in part we have, um, a lot of resistance because things have always been done that way and that's how we're going to do them in the future. Um, I think that the, the um, focus on pollinators as kind of like it is an entry boy, an entry point um, mm -hmm. really resonates with a lot of people. Um, and particularly, you know, if you can get you know, school kids to raise milkweed and butterflies and monarch butterflies it really kind of solidifies that connection between the native plants and uh, a really charismatic organism. Mm -hmm. um, I think oftentimes the success or the failure of various uh, ordinances and, and, and uh, these sorts of things that 
really rests on having the right kinds of champions for these things already within uh, within local government. Um, and the, the effort in Somerville um, took nearly three years of meeting with the city and going back and forth and ended up being championed by a woman who is now the mayor of, of Somerville. Um, and, and I think that her political clout and connections was really integral to kind of pushing it over the finishing line and getting it adopted. Um, I've heard of other similar efforts that despite, you know, great public interest and support and signed petitions and so forth, um, that it would just die in the committee because, you know, the people are just not into it or they don't see the value of it or they don't want to do things differently than the way they've done them in the past. Sure. Um, you know, nationally, I think that that the success of all of these efforts really has to be grassroots. I think that, uh, for example, um, Doug Tallamy's homegrown national park initiative is a really fantastic idea in, in sort of tying together people's pride and sense of place in national parks and thinking, I can have that in my own backyard by planting these right kinds of plants and having the same kinds of diversity that I can find at the national park down the road. Um, I really don't see, particularly given the political climate now and how polarized things are, um, that environmental issues will rise above any of the other societal or moral issues that seem to be um, the subject of many discussions today. Sure. Okay, so, um, yeah, <laughs> it's a tough one. Since many woody plants won't flower for years, a decade or more in some cases when grown from seed, and that time is, is someone has to care for it. So the market is more likely to support clonal propagation mm -hmm. for more mature species in terms of what people will pay. Can you yes. suggest an approach to woody plants that are not typically seed grown? Hmm. Well, I mean, so the, the, the reality of it is that the nursery industry as a, as a whole has moved away from people who used to grow things from seed and then put them out in a field and you know waited the time. Um, more often than not, wholesale nurseries are not growing their plants. They're buying them in as liners. And so smaller plants that somebody else is doing the rooting of the cuttings. And it's all in a way to be the most cost effective. Um, but it's really what's what's missing in all of this is a a chain of information about if you're interested in provenance, where does a plant come from? It's hard to track if the wholesaler doesn't know where the liner person came from, and then where did the liner people get their material from? So there's a lot of broken pieces of information. Um, I also had a very interesting conversation recently with uh, Larry Weiner, uh, who does a lot of meadows and so forth. Um, and he was talking about how many of the shrubs that are normally suckering in colonial shrubs, um, if they're grown from cuttings, they do not sucker as much as if they were seed grown. Okay. So it's kind of an interesting thing again that, you know, what's causing that, I don't know. Um, you know, it's really hard to get away from cuttings and cloned plants because it's the majority of what's available. Mm -hmm. um, there are nurseries that do grow uh, um, from seed uh, and woodies, um, but they're few and far between. Mm -hmm. um, so I think pragmatically, as far as an approach goes, you know, if you're selecting plants that are species at least, mm -hmm. um, and I know there's other folks that are working on, on you know, propagation protocols, like how do you, how do you grow Comptonia from cuttings and things that are a little bit harder to grow uh, um, and more reliable um, that we're trying to work that out. So that I think is already a step in the right direction than, you know, planting more forsythia or, uh, uh, um, you know, Rosa Sharon or something like that. So again, yeah. I don't want the perfect being the enemy of the good here. Yeah. Um, and that any step, whether it's a cultivar, whether it's a cloned cutting, is a step in the right direction. Right. True. Um, to that end, the, the question is, what are some leading questions 
you would ask a native plant nursery to better understand their philosophy or practices besides the pesticides? Um, I think the second thing would be provenance. Okay. You know, so um, making sure that they try to provide that information uh, as much as they know it, because um, people want to know where their plants are from. Um, and, um, you know, to say that it's a, you know, it's an Ohio native, that's great. Ohio is a big state, you know, they could come from any number of places. Um, the next thing I would add is um, provide better ecological information for these plants, whether it's a cultivar or not. But let me know, like, what kind of insects does it support beyond just saying it's bee friendly? Um, mm -hmm. Bee friendly means what I saw a bumblebee on it or a honeybee. Um, but there are, you know, 400 plus species of bees in the eastern part of the United States, and the honeybee and the bumblebee is one or two of those. Uh, what else does it support? Is it a larval host for a caterpillar or, or, or for a butterfly or for a moth? Um, I think these are also good informations to ask, uh, information to ask for. Um, and yeah, and to try to encourage them as much as possible. I know this is this is kind of a, a, a difficult question, but to consider carrying seed grown things. Uh, it might take a little bit longer. Um, you know, part of it is not is the economics of the nursery industry, and part of it is also um, rests with designers and architects demanding uh, uniform uh, 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 plants that all look alike that can be plugged into a design so they'll all grow the same height and so forth. And when you grow things from seed, you get, you get everything. You get the really robust plant, but then you also get the little spindly plant that maybe you would look, look over, but maybe that's the one that is disease resistant or the most drought tolerant, or, you know, there's some, there's some characters that you can't see beyond, you know, bigger flowers or show your foliage. Um, but we're not selecting for those things. We still select for primarily aesthetic reasons. Um, sure. So those are some pretty big shifts to ask nursery owners to consider. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's great. Thank you. Um, Anita has inherited a Japanese maple and she's looking for good suggestions for natural pollinators to plant around it or by this tree. Mm. <laughs> well, I mean, is it, uh, is it a sun condition or is it part shade? Um, you know, maples are all generally wind pollinated. Mm -hmm. um, and so you could really put, uh, uh, you know, if it's in a shady or in a woodland situation, there's a number of wonderful spring plants, wild geraniums, spring ephemerals, bloodroot. Uh, um, those are all great choices for earlier flowering. Uh, um, um, you can do things like, um, uh, there's good shade, ast shade asters and goldenrods, again, if it's dry shade. Um, I would say really try to think of things that extend the flowering season throughout from spring to summer into fall, mm -hmm. uh, if you can. Um, and probably I'd say, you know, again, this is my own aesthetic, but um, maybe things with, with larger, bolder leaves as a, as a contest to the kind of finer texture of some of the Japanese maples. Right. Okay, um, David asked, what are the biggest problems people have when planting native plants in their garden? And what are the solutions? Hmm. Well, um, I'd say first and foremost, there is a, a little bit of a fallacy that native plants are no maintenance <laughs> or low maintenance. And uh, they can be once they get themselves established, but like any plant, they need attention in the first couple of years, uh, which means you know, if you're if you're citing them well and you're putting them into the kind of conditions that they like, you're still going to need to water them a little bit for the first year until they can get themselves established, uh, and then they can be on their own. Um, I think uh, another one is is um, planting plants that are that are that are that spread uh, and seed in a lot and expecting them to stay put. Um, I think that that. If you use native plants, you also have to understand that they're going to grow and change and move. And that um, if your design concept is like, I want it to always look like this, then you're probably going to run into problems um, when the plants don't do what you want. Mm -hmm. um, 
One of the other frequent questions that I get are, there's something eating the leaves of my plant and I, should I be worried? And do I need to reach for some kind of, you know, chemical or something to kill the bugs? Um, and again, I would say that this is actually what you want to see happen. Um, and that um, this plant is food for other things. And so if there's something eating the leaves, it's a caterpillar, well, then, you know, maybe your nesting chickadee is going to come down and help you out and, uh, and take those caterpillars and feed it to, to um, you know, her nestlings and the, the cycle of life continues. So um, you can't expect to have completely blemish-free specimen plants all the time with natives. And I think you should expect some degree of nibbles and, uh, mm -hmm. and little things and the plants just grow right through it for the most part. Sure, so, yeah. Those are just a couple of, um, you know, off the hand, off the top of the head. Sure. Well, um, Uli, the question is, do you have a couple of your favorite ferns and why are those your favorite ones? Well, I do have a couple. Um, so for, and so I want to divide them into kind of two broad groups. Um, ferns that, that make nice clumps and, and are, are good kind of accents and that basically just get bigger over time. And then ferns that have rhizomes that will run and spread and fill in around uh, um, plantings. So um, for a larger fern, uh, I've always been a big fan of interrupted fern um, and, uh, and cinnamon fern um, because they have that sort of upright kind of like a, a, a you know, like a, badminton shuttlecock kind of vase shape. Um, and they tend to just make bigger clumps over time so they can be good accents. Um, for spreading ferns, um, I really like the uh, beach ferns. So there's two, there's broad beach and, and narrow beach ferns, Phagopterus. Um, and they have this really neat kind of triangular shape frond. They only grow about 10, 12 inches or less. So they stay pretty low. And they just do a really wonderful job of filling in and covering space. And you can plant all kinds of things to come up out of them. Um, we've got a really wonderful combination of this and uh, Trillium grandiflorum in the garden. And it looks just fantastic, the two together. Mm -hmm. um, and then later on the season, some of our uh, woodland asters and everything then come up through the ferns as well. And um, I think they're just, it's just a great plant. Yeah, lovely. So those are my, my current favorites. That could change tomorrow, so. <laughs> also depends on where you're at, right? So yeah. are there, um, so here's a question from Michael. Are there any states that are doing a good job of planting native plants in their highway right of ways, as opposed to just knowing them? And by good, he means using natives in more than just a few test plots, but extensively throughout the state, if you know. Please. Well, I know that uh, um, the state of Delaware had a, had a pilot program um, maybe 10 or 15 years ago with, with you know, what it was like wildflowers on roadsides. Um, I know that there are uh, states in the Midwest and in the, so like Texas and Iowa, for example, have some really great programs where they're encouraging uh, uh, um, wildflowers in the medians and so forth. Um, I can't say I know of any other really good examples. Mm -hmm. I think that there's just the, the amount of acreage of, of, of median strips and right of ways and, and roadsides is pretty substantial. And there's lots of laws about making sure that things are always at a certain height for sight lines and so forth. Um, I do recall an amusing anecdote of, of reading about a person who was involved in a fender bender on a highway and when the case went to court, she made the argument that she had been distracted by the wildflowers and wasn't paying attention, and which is why she shouldn't be held responsible for rear-ending the person in front of her. Um, it is hard to not botanize from the car though. Yes. <laughs> I can have sympathy for her. Yes. Well, okay. I mean, sometimes they, you know, you, you do get some nice little patches here and there, so. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I've never seen anywhere that is, you know, like, miles and miles of it it's always just little test plots little that, test plots um, yeah that you know they either work or they don't yeah well jumping back to the neonics for a second here but the question had come in when you were talking about them 
how long do they stay within a given plant? Um, I think that that it can be on the order of five, seven years, depending. I mean, a lot of the other like systemic pesticides that, you know, for example, people that treat hemlocks for woolly adelgid, they use a, um, a systemic um, neonicotinoid called imidacloprid. And it usually has a, an active life of somewhere around five years before it begins to lose efficacy. Okay. So that's probably a good ballpark answer. But you know, every plant is different. It metabolizes things differently. So, um, but needless to say that you can expect it. It'll it'll be there for a couple of years for sure. Sure. Well, we just had someone ask about like you know concern over promoting native plants and the fear that someone might go out into our natural areas and start digging up plants and taking them just to move them into their garden and where they can buy these plants. And I'm going to drop a link into the chat. Um, of a wonderful website that exists here in Northeast Ohio that will help you find a local nursery, um, both if you're doing wholesale or retail, to, um, to find native plants in our region so you can buy them in a, um, in a proper manner, not digging them up. So yeah. um, hopefully I mean, folks aren't doing that, but I'm sure they are. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think that there's probably more of a threat from the foraging community than mm -hmm. from somebody saying, I want to landscape my backyard for free by poaching yeah. things down the road. Sure. Um, you know, I think that they're, they're very well intentioned to, you know, find your dinner out in the forest. Um, but I've also heard of many examples of over harvesting or not knowing your plants and taking something that's very rare because you know you found it and so it really becomes more of a moral and ethical question than yeah. um you know poaching will happen unfortunately yeah. um yeah. there's not much to to prevent that yes and then the uh, the last thing i want to touch on since there were quite a few questions about it and it came up in the chat is the deer problem. I mean, there isn't a plant out there that's going to be deer resistant if they're really hungry, right? Yes. Or what, what can you, can you speak a little bit to the deer resistance? <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, I do try to, I think in one of the lists I, I, I included was deer resistant shrubs. Um, but, um, but the truth is that, you know, they're going to try just about anything, um, and short of short of you know putting up a fence, having a dog, um, you know you're going to have to contend with it in some way, shape, or form. And it's unfortunate because it also means that uh, um, there are certain kinds of things that you won't be able to grow. Um, the last thing I'll also say is that you know deer are like many wild animals, they are creatures of habit and they are constantly investigating their environment and their route. You know, so if you have deer in your neighbor, in your backyard, it's probably the same deer and his friends that come through there every night on their route to wherever they sleep, to where they go during the day and so forth. So when something new pops up, they're gonna come check it out and maybe yeah. they'll nibble it and maybe they won't. Um, but then at some point they're going to accept that it's there and they might pass it by. I planted a, uh, uh, an elderberry in my backyard and the first three years, uh, never saw a single berry or a flower because the deer came and ate it up. This year they've just passed by. I can't explain it. Uh, maybe the, the shrub is big enough now, um, but it's full of flowers and the deer don't seem to be bothered by it and they're off to eat something else. Um, you know, you could also encourage your neighbors to plant a lot of hostas, maybe draw your draw them away from your garden if you want. No, <laughs> can't do that. Um, but yeah, I, I, there's no good answer for it, unfortunately. Yeah, um, sure. <laughs> and, and it's just, it, it's tough because there's so many wonderful plants that people could invite in their gardens um, that will just get nibbled. Um, right. Really, so I, I think what you, hit on with the fence is unfortunately the only real 
guaranteed solution to the problem. Yeah, or you know, support people that that uh, will hunt the deer and thin sure. thin, uh, thin the populations. And that's true. That's also reality. Mm -hmm. You know, develop yeah. a taste for venison. <laughs> what I'm about to tell you. <laughs> well, listen, I don't know. Can you see my book? Yes, it's hard on here, but. By the book, I put the link in the chat. So, Uli, thank you so much for um, chatting with us this evening about Absolutely. your new book. And um, yeah, hope and let me because uh, I see that there were quite a lot of other questions that we didn't have time to get to. Um, but I was going to put my email address in the chat here. Excellent. Um, and if folks feel like they have follow up questions, um, please feel free to reach out and contact me, um, and I'll try to answer them as quickly as I can. Sure. Um, and I and I will probably follow up too with some of the questions that came in that were were, were a little lengthy. So yeah, no, I see. I was just kind of scrolling the chat and yeah. the QA and there's some good ones in there that yeah. uh, I wish we had more time to address. So well, okay. I mean we we sure could if you want to, Uli. Is there I, I could stay on for a couple more minutes if you want to I could do maybe two or three more questions. Sure. Okay. Okay, excellent. Well, uh, one of the questions that came up were about mosses and fun fungi, good, mm -hmm. bad, um, happiness as they relate to natural landscapes or gardens. Can you? Um, I I love moss in the garden. I think moss is something that is um, really hard to grow on purpose, um, but if you have it in your garden, you could cultivate it and you can uh, you can help it along. Um, our my my staff at the garden actually all have tiny little brushes and in their sections they like groom the moss and kind of weed it and um and it, it actually ends up being a really wonderful place to plant and work with diminutive plants and things like um partridge berry or houstonia um that are they're tiny and they and they will otherwise be overwhelmed by a lot of leaf litter but they look just amazing and and, and you know coming out of a bed of moss uh, and they can seed in nicely in the moss. And um, so I'm a big fan of it. Fungi, uh, similarly, um, you know, a lot of the uh, um, fruiting bodies that we see are actually uh, belong to mycorrhizal species. So having those, um, if you have, if you're fortunate enough to have things like ghost pipes in your garden, oh. um, the monotropa, um, mm. those are they're parasites of mycorrhizae. And so okay. if you have them in your garden, it also means that you have a good population of this fungus that is connecting and, and, and um, brokering communication and resources between trees and other plants. So okay. fungi are incredibly important um, and um, I welcome them in the garden um, as much as I do moss. Uh, I think they're both great. Great. Okay, well, we're going to do one more here. Regina was planning to purchase plants that are native to her county and rare, and she was told she shouldn't bring outside genetics in that might interfere with the native ones. So if the plant is rare and there isn't a group saving it to provide local seeds or plants, what is the best way to return these plants to our area? Um, could you be specific and tell me which plant you're talking about, Regina, if that's possible? I know. So this is, this is a, uh, um, you can put it in the chat, Regina, if you are, yeah, it's, it's an interesting topic because, um, so plants are either rare because they, um, they are sort of at a, a limit of their range and distribution. Um, so, you know, maybe this is a plant that just gets into Ohio, but the bulk of its range is further South, or it's a plant that is, endemic, meaning it's only found in a particular area and nowhere else. Um, and so you might be able to, uh, a verbena in your Northwest Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. yeah. okay. um, so <clears throat> you might be able to source this plant from say Prairie Moon Nursery out in Wisconsin. Um, and Prairie Moon is getting their verbenas from Wisconsin or Minnesota. And so this uh, represents a, a distinct genetic population that in the wild would never meet your verbenas in Pennsylvania. And the concern is that if you bring those in together with one another, that uh, it could lead to what's called an outbreeding depression. 
or an introduction of some maladaptive genes that results in lower seed set, lower fertility. Uh, basically, uh, it's a net negative for the population. Uh, Ernst is another one too. I mean, they will sell their seeds to whoever wants to buy it, um, which is how they stay in business, quite frankly. But um, rare plants again, and this is this is one of those things that like you, some nurseries sell rare plants, and so you can buy them, and you're like, oh, I have this amazing special thing in my garden, and you might not know that there's a remnant population, you know, a couple miles away in a natural area. And there's nothing to prevent bees or whatever from moving pollen around. Um, because none of this has been really thoroughly studied, and it has to be uh, uh, um, uh, um, it has to really be studied on a you know species by species basis. The conservative approach is to not do it. You know, we have conservation organizations uh, that track these things. Um, if you're really concerned about it, like reach out to the Natural Heritage Bureau in Pennsylvania and say, look, I'm concerned that this population is, you know, in decline because of negative, uh, because of invasive species or some other kind of threats. And like, what are you guys going to do to ensure that it survives in, in Northwest Pennsylvania? Um, there may be other land trusts or other organizations that you could turn to um, that may be able to do this work. Um, rather than, and it's one of the reasons why uh, Native Plant Trust um, is, um, is, doesn't sell rare plants. You know, we are a conservation organization and we have, you know, decades long uh, uh, relationships with natural heritage bureaus and so forth that we could risk jeopardizing if we're just selling rare plants to whoever wants to buy it. Um, and there's already been examples of this where People have reported new rare plant occurrences. They turned out to be planted. They say, hey, well, where'd you get the plants? Oh, we bought them at Native Plant Trust, you know, 10 years ago. Um, and so it just makes their job harder. And think about it this way too, that um, a lot of conservation funding uh, goes to natural heritage bureaus based upon the abundance or lack of abundance of these populations in the state. And when new ones start popping up left and right, it makes it harder for them to distinguish what's naturally occurring, what was introduced, and also threatens their funding for that particular plant. Sure. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, I see here you said it, Andy Ernst said that not to bring in the plants, they, they only have a common source, not nothing of a local ecotype. So, you know, common source probably means that they sourced it from a, any number of individuals or from a place where it is very common and not rare. Um, and particularly with their operation where they're planting out, you know, acres of plants for seed production, um, you're not getting any particular maternal lines when you're getting seed from them. You're getting it from, you know, many lots of different individuals. It's, it's, a, it's an interesting topic. Um, yeah. And one I think that would be worth exploring maybe in another talk. Um, but, um, but yeah, there's a lot more to it than that. So. Uh, uh, hopefully the answer was uh, um, was uh, good yeah. enough. Yeah, Verbena Simplex. Um, you know, we're 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 going to we're going to survey <laughs> for that in Connecticut uh, later on this month, and it hasn't been seen in the state of Connecticut since 1905. Wow! So it's a rare plant. Neat, neat. Well, excellent. I can, I can take one more if you want, and then. Um, okay, well, you know, there's three left here. They're all kind of long, Lily. Did you, did you glance at any of them? Gosh, one is about buckthorn. Um, and when they remove the buckthorn, there are native seedlings, but the deer come in. Yeah. And so, you know, trying to figure out how to balance that. All I could think about is putting a deer exclosure around. Yeah, the enclosures, site. unfortunately. Yeah. You know, um... <clears throat> So then, it's anonymous asks here about uh, um, uh, what is one you would ask make uh, uh, one ask you would make of landscape designers knowing that we are almost trying to strike a balance between budget yeah. aesthetic maintenance uh, and and um, site tough conditions. Um, you know, I think that th this is again this is a, a, a another paradox of working in public gardens versus in commercial horticulture, um, and in that public gardens have the luxury of being able to experiment and try combinations and try things that may or may not work. 
And it's not an approach that you can do with a client unless you want to go out of business very quickly. Um, so um, I think that finding combinations that work and that work for you and for these different site combinations, uh, and there's nothing wrong with replicating those, even if it's saying I'm working with, you know, a, a group of maybe 10 or, <coughs> excuse me, 10 or 15 like workhorse species that you know are going to do well and perform. Um, and that that's really what you're selling these people on in terms of an aesthetic that you can predict, um, a maintenance regime, regime that you can predict. Um, and then, you know, trying to find those clients few and far between that are that are going to be willing to let you try a little something on the side and say, hey, look, you know, we, we know this combination works and these things work. Um, we really are interested in trying to, to expand our palette and work with these plants. And, um, you know, we think your site would be a great, you know, experiment for a test for it. And, you know, are you willing? I don't know. Um, you know, so the right the right kind of client would be absolutely happy to try stuff in, in service of, you know, the greater good. Um, but like I said, I think there's nothing wrong with trying to stick with, you know, a, a, a shorter list of of tried and true favorites and things that you know will perform well for you. Um, and then you have your own home garden that you can experiment, you know, that's where yeah. you can try things out. Sure. Well, sounds great. Well, I, I think that's it for the Q&A. Uli, I, I thank you so much for covering everyone's question. My pleasure. My yeah. pleasure. You guys have some great questions. Yeah, great. OK, well, everyone have a, have a nice evening. And remember to, to pick up the book. I always I have to do this the right way, right? There we go. <laughs> I put the thank link you all in the for chat again. In. Yes. Thank you very much. Take care, everyone. Bye. Bye now.